The thing that really got me was the stats that I found out that I wasn't aware of until I went and did that research. And, you know, the numbers are horrendous. Um, 800,000 people a year die by suicide. And that's just the recorded numbers. Like it's actually going to be higher than that. So I guess where I got to was I think about, you know, across the world, there's in, in almost every manufacturing organization and lots of service organizations as well. There's CI, t- CI teams, the CI people who, um, you know, are trained in these different techniques. And if we can just get them to tweak their focus, to focus on people and how we can help people, then maybe we can, we can help people with this issue. You know, maybe we can apply some of those skills in a slightly different way. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Swan. And I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and we are from the Just In Time Cafe, and welcome to our podcast. At the cafe, we wrestle with tough questions, talk to thought leaders, discuss great books, and get insights from Lean Six Sigma practitioners. We let you in on helpful apps, bring you the news, and challenge the status quo so you can build your problem-solving muscles. Hey, Elizabeth, so what's on the cafe menu today? Um, It's a great day, Tracy. Today's highlight is our interview with Gemma Jones, one of the founders of the Kata Girl Geeks. Gemma has developed a way to mobilize continuous improvement practitioners to help underserved and at-risk members of society. And she's gonna share it for the first time ever with us today. Next up, it's an app that helps you do more by doing nothing. And for Q&A, we asked our problem-solving community how they escaped the impulse to compare themselves to others. And they all told us they were better than us. I'm kidding. (laughs) They gave us some great techniques to avoid the trap of compare and despair and to focus on our own crucial work. And that makes it a great day at the cafe, Tracy. Absolutely. Up next is Hot Apps. Yes, Tracy, today's app is called Calm. It's an app that helps productivity by helping people do nothing. What'd you find out about it? Well, it definitely gives you strategies to improve lots of things that I think many people need right now. Improving sleep quality, reducing anxiety, improving focus, helping move more. That's important since we're all virtual and sitting at home a lot, but they've also got music, sleep stories, wisdom snippets, and soundscapes and breathing techniques in case you forgot how to breathe, which sometimes we do forget how to breathe. And in today's world, who couldn't use strategies for less stress, right? Oh yeah. So now the Calm app has a business segment. So organizations can help make mental fitness the newest employee benefit. They have a calm blog you could sign up for and webinars you can attend. One webinar title was Mental Fitness for the Workplace, Building Resilience in Uncertain Times. Sign me up for that one. Uh, The timing of things varies on this app too. There are some things that last only 10 minutes, some 30 and some 45 minutes. So there's, if you only got five minutes or seven minutes, they'll probably have an app that you can use and you probably very much need. Uh, So there's lots of options for signing up too. You can sign up as a student for only $8.99 a year. Or if you think your family is really frazzled, you can buy a family plan for 99 bucks for six people. That would include my dog. For business, you can get packages from five to 100 people or 101 people plus. For five users, I looked it up, it was about 60 bucks a person per year or a total of $292 for business application. I wasn't able to get pricing for users over 101, but it has a few more features that seem to be included in that, that offering, like webinars and events that you could attend. So I also use this app too. I attended a series of sessions on how to meditate with Jeff Warren that I really enjoyed. And I have to be honest, before that session, I didn't think I could meditate. I didn't think I really was good at meditating, but it gave me confidence. So what did you discover, Elizabeth? I've actually got this app on my phone. I was using it daily for a few years, but I fell off the wagon a few months ago. So I'm 
I'm really glad you suggested featuring it since this is going to jumpstart my practice again. And I got into reading it. I got into it after reading a book that was called something like the 15 habits of super successful people. One of those. (laughs) And the author had interviewed all these titans of industry and found that most of them had some kind of daily meditation practice. And the author confessed that he had no idea if it worked, but he was resolved to meditate if all these other successful people were doing it. So I, I was intrigued, but I find it really useful personally because I am an impatient person, as you might have experienced, Tracy. <laughs> nah. nah, my impulse is to jump into action. But if I take the time to meditate for just 10 minutes, it helps me focus. I do a better job of approaching my day with clearer intentions. And the analogy I'm going to give you is that my instinct can be to see my work as a laundry list of to-dos. But if I approach it like that without enough thought, then the laundry is all going to come out pink. (laughs) So I use the Daily Calm app featuring uh, Tamara Levitt. She does the Daily Calm and she's got a different focus every day. She got you to sit, sit up straight, close your eyes. She guides you to stay silent and then she delivers a mini lesson. And sometimes those lessons spark ideas and get me writing. Um, The app also has sleep stories that you mentioned. So you you can have, you can use those to have someone kind of talk you to sleep. The the voices are low and slow. And I tried those when I couldn't sleep because I was taking steroids to combat poison ivy. I had a ridiculous case of poison ivy and I was so wired that I figured maybe a sleep story would help me. So I listened to people like, I tried them all, just so you know. I listened to people like Killian Murphy, and he talked about, you know, crossing Ireland by train, and his voice was like that. But it only made me want to book a flight and go touring Ireland. (laughs) I was lying there, planning my vacation instead of sleeping. So do not (laughs) doubt the power of steroids. So Khan might not be powerful enough to combat steroids, but it can wholeheartedly endorse the Daily Calm app that that really works it's just 10 minutes it's all i needed to to get that focus so back to the business plan it's a great thing to offer employees you know how wonderful to help people practice uh and encourage staff to approach their day and their jobs with more focus and less stress and people are more productive and have better sense of well-being uh and what's better than that absolutely We'll include the link to Calm on the podcast post on our website so you can check it out. I'm Elizabeth Swan, and you're listening to the Just in Time Cafe podcast. In a short while, you get to hear our interview with Gemma Jones. Next up, it's an issue we pose to our community. There's a great quote, comparison is the thief of joy. And although I can't find agreement on the, who the author of that quote is, it really struck home. It's talking about envy and jealousy. And those are intensely human responses. And they feel horrible. And they can stop you from doing what you need to do. You get wound up and thinking that everyone except you has figured everything out. So it paralyzes people. You know, and they struggle with feeling less than. You know, as much as we get intellectually that comparison is pointless, we still risk, you know, that knee-jerk self-pity when somebody else is doing well. And social media means we know when people are doing well. And this got me thinking of my late stepfather's story he told about attending his 35th Harvard reunion. And he's in the buffet line and he overheard two classmates. And what he realizes is that they were discussing their gigantic six-figure salaries. And then he thought and he realized Every single member of his class made way more money than he did. And then he smiled and he said, but I could still kick all their asses. <laughs> so I love that story for so many reasons. He was funny and he had been a stellar athlete. You know, he was invited to join, I think, the Baltimore Orioles farm team. He didn't do it. But so there's some truth to that joke, which is essential. But more imp- importantly, he his ability to laugh at himself in that moment was part of what made him a great man. You know, standing there in that buffet line, I think he felt pangs of regret. He made very little money in his life, but he left a stunning legacy. He dedicated his life to co-founding and running an alternative reform school. He called himself a professional father figure, and he was, he's also a great father. And he helped a lot of young men turn their lives around. There are books, TV specials, 
lots of accounts of his impact. And he did all that, but he was human. And the option to give in and compare himself to people who made more money was always there, but he chose to kick its ass instead. And that kind of feels like a great lesson. If we look, we can always find someone better than us and it can stop us from doing our own great work. So we asked our community, how do you escape the impulse to compare yourself to others? And here's some of what we heard. Uh, Karen Ross, author of The Kind Leader and founder of the Loving Kindness Project, said when she was in her first year of university, she had a revelation. Everyone has a different job. Each of us is having our own unique purpose. Uh, you know, she doesn't compare herself to others since other people's jobs are not the same as hers. And she sees us, our parts that are not singular. It's more like puzzle pieces. You know, and if we do our part, then the puzzle, you know, if we don't do our part, then the puzzle won't be completed. So there's no need to compare ourselves to someone else. What we need to do is understand our specific purpose, work on fulfilling it, and help others fulfill theirs. And I like that idea that we're puzzle pieces, right? And that we, we pay attention to others, but to know how the puzzle works, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Here's another good one from Katie Anderson, author of Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. She said that when she stepped off the traditional career ladder eight years ago, it was liberating and a bit scary. She had to redefine what success meant to her. It was no longer about getting promoted into higher levels. She realized it has always been about impact, connection, learning, and joy for her. And there's no one set definition of that. It also reminded her of Isao Yoshino's experience that she shared in her book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, about how he changed his mindset and created a positive experience by learning to compare self to self, not to others, and to pursue personal excellence in whatever that may be, not as compared to others. Kind of like golf. We always are, you know, comparing ourselves to golf. And, you know, your story about your dad, it reminded me that, you know, as moms, we do that too. We sometimes compare our children or we hear about other people's children being successful. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have this, the you know, comparison is the thief of joy. And I'll never forget one time I was talking with two of my mom friends and they were talking about their kids and how smart they were and that they did this thing and there's reading these awesome books. And I, and I just looked at him and I go, well, you know, my son right now, he likes to freeze things, you know, like put them in water and, and put them in ice and put them in the freezer and big, make big, really, really big ice cubes. And they both looked at me, they go, a scientist. <laughs> He's a scientist. <laughs> I love it. It's so easy to do the comparison. Here's some good guidance on that same thing that you just mentioned. You say, oh, she needs to say, uh, uh, comparing self to self, right? Um, Stephanie Hill, owner of Lightbulb Moment Consulting, she cited the book, The Midnight Library, which talks about life as a swim meet. And she said, you focus on your own time and you stay in your lane. If you turn your head to find out where other people are, you'll slow down. You'll well up with some kind of unproductive emotion and you'll fall behind the goal you set for yourself. And I can visualize the swim lane, can't you? Absolutely. You know that looking at others slows you down. So here's another great reminder from Jamie Parker. She hosts the fantastic podcast, Lean Leadership for Ops Managers. She said that even as folks read the responses to this post, it might be automatic for some to think, oh, look, she overcame this problem or she doesn't compare herself. I wish I was like that. <laughs> so essentially, falling into comparison reading comments about how folks escape the impulse to compare. So that's such a keen insight. So if you're listening to this, don't think for a second that we are above the impulse to compare ourselves to others. We all fall victim. We do. So here's one from Dwight Harris Jr., an operational excellence speaker. He had a slight twist on the idea of having to focus on our own efforts and our own accomplishments. He sees that slight comparisons are necessary to ensure there's no bias or inequities. He sees that 90% of the focus needs to be on your own efforts. He cautioned that we should still take care about other people along the way. 
that we should still care about other people along the way. We just need to compartmentalize. Nice, Tracy. These are powerful mm. emotions that can keep us from bringing our own special sauce into the world. It helps to acknowledge that we all do it so we can rise above it and get back to doing what we do best, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. We host these monthly, so you can go to the www.jitcafe.com and go to our podcast page. Coming up next, it's our featured guest, Gemma Jones. Elizabeth, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Gemma? I'd love to, Tracy. Uh, Gemma started her career in engineering and quickly found a passion for improvement. She spent 20 years in manufacturing and R&D across numerous industries. Then in 2018, she left employment to build her own business, which is called Spark Improvement. She's also the co-founder of the Kata Geek Girls, a free exchange community working to expand the practice of Toyota Kata among women. Gemma's mission is to help organizations be the best they can be through a combination of lean thinking, Toyota Kata, visual facilitation, and experiential learning. Gemma is based in Cheshire in the UK. All right, today we have our beloved colleague, Gemma Jones with us here at the Just In Time Cafe. How are you today, Gemma? I'm great, thank you. I'm great, thank you, how are you? Uh, I am doing well. So it's early, early morning for me and very late, not too late for Gemma. And so we're making this work based on our UK and California times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll I'll sit in the middle with the East Coast. (laughs) (laughs) So Gemma Jones, I'm not sure if you've heard of her before, but she has a lot of gifts. She is heavily embedded in the Toyota Kata world and with the Kata Girl Geeks, the first original Kata Girl Geek. Uh, And they focus on daily practice of applying the scientific method. But... Today, we're gonna talk about continuous improvement from a different angle. So this project in particular is personal and has become extremely important to you, Gemma. Did you wanna share the story of how suicide prevention became a focus for you? Of course, of course. Thank you for having me as well. So so my story sort of starts um, just over three years ago. And I was in employment. I was working for a manufacturing organization. I was the continuous improvement manager. Um, I'd been in CI for about 22 years at the time. And I'd always felt very strongly since the very sort of early on in my lean training that people were really important. And so I spent a lot of time building relationships, building trust. Every day I would spend time on the shop floor or with people in the offices or the labs building those relationships and getting to know people. Um, It was really, really important to me. And about, uh, so about three and a half years ago, I was working with a close colleague, uh, with a colleague who was a supervisor of part of the production area. And he was very passionate about continuous improvement, very passionate about helping his people solve problems, about empowering them to, you know, solve their challenges. And he and I were building a problem solving training course together um, that we were going to deliver, first of all, to to a team, including him. And then he wanted to take it on and sort of develop it further with his people. And so we'd spent about six months developing this problem solving training module uh, with practical aspects, you know, where they would go learn and, and kind of practice through those problem solving steps. And it came to the day of the training when um, when I was going to deliver that training to him and to some other people. And he pulled out of the training. He came in the office and said, you know, I'm far too busy. I've got so much going on. I'm really stressed. I can't come to the training. And at the time, I thought, you know, that's that's really odd. You know, he's been really passionate about this for six months. I know how excited he was about this day, but I can see he's a bit stressed. So, you know, I'm going to I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to go after him. So, so that happened, we delivered the training, he and I chatted about it, you know, he seemed all right. And then three days later, I came into work to find out that he had died by suicide. Now, you know, this was a huge shock. I knew, I knew he was stressed. 
I didn't know he was that stressed. I would have said there was 20 other people on site who were who were more stressed than him. You know, this this floored me. Um, and, you know, none of us, none of us really knew what to say or to do. Um, we sort of all of a sudden you've got to, you know, somehow respond to this and look after people. There were people there that had known him for many, many years um, and were obviously really affected by it. And so I started, I realized that the level of my incompetence, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know the best thing to do. So I, I started Googling, I started doing research. I started, you know, looking up different resources on the web and there was lots out there. But um, um, basically what I learned is, is just, just go and listen to them. You know, you haven't got to give anyone any answers at this point. They're grieving. Just go listen. Just go talk to people. The thing that really got me was the stats that I found out that I wasn't aware of until I went and did that research. And, you know, the numbers are horrendous. Um, 800,000 people a year die by suicide. And that's just the recorded numbers. Like it's actually going to be higher than that. Um, it's twice as many as die by homicide. You know, we're all scared of murderers and stuff going on, but actually twice as many people die by suicide. And that's one every 40 seconds. Like this is, it's, it's, it's a crazy number and it floored me. If you're a man under 50, your most likely cause of death is suicide. And I came home to two teenage boys and a husband thinking, you know, I've been worried about you in the swimming pool or crossing the road or having an accident, whereas actually that's not necessarily what I need to be worried about. So, so I sort of uncovered all of this information that I didn't know anything about. And I realized, you know, there's lots I could do to be better here. Um, and the way I felt at the time, and, you know, I, I guess I still do, but at the time I was floored by a sense of guilt and shame that, you know, he didn't come to us, that he didn't talk to me. I'd worked pretty closely with him for six months and, you know, I had no idea and I felt very ashamed. And a lot of people at the time kind of said to me, you know, there's nothing you could have done. You know, he'd made his decision. There's nothing you could have done. And at the time, I, I just couldn't accept that. I couldn't accept that, you know, this was just a done deal, that there was nothing anyone could have done to help. So. One of the things I then did was I went and did a mental health first aid, a training course, a two day training course. I did that in my own time. Um, it wasn't a large outlay. It was fairly reasonable training, but it was incredible. And what that did was give me the, the training and the knowledge so that I could respond better, so that I could notice the signs in people and so that I could respond better. And I learned about signs and symptoms. I learned you know, lots of things about different mental health issues, but particularly, obviously, the suicide part of it was very close to my heart. Um, and one of the things that they taught us is that, you know, suicidal thoughts are, are usually temporary and they're usually based on unclear thinking. And what it got me to thinking about was, you know, as CI practitioners, a lot of what we do is about bringing clarity to thinking. It's about helping people think more clearly to make decisions, to overcome challenges, to overcome obstacles. And it made me think that, you know, um, there's a lot of tools and techniques that we use in CI that actually could help individuals. Um, I learned on the training that actually asking someone directly about their intentions can actually lower their anxiety to the, to the point where actually, you know, they may not follow through with it. Um, just helping people to get to talk, to talk through their issues and their concerns, you know, can give them the support they need to be able to carry on. So I guess where I got to was, I think about, you know, across the world, there's in, in almost every manufacturing organization and lots of service organizations as well, there's CI, CI teams, the CI people who, um, you know, are trained in these different techniques. And if we can just get them to tweak their focus to focus on people and how we can help people, then maybe we can, we can help people with this issue. You know, maybe we can apply some of those skills in a slightly different way. Wow, that is very powerful, Gemma. And I'm, I'm sorry you had to experience that. What a powerful experience. And this, you shouldn't be shamed. You should not feel shamed. I know you do, but it's, 
It's hard to see the signs. I, I think about what you just said, and there have been people that I could have thought, wow, are they, they seem very stressed. Are they on the verge of doing something terrible that I, you know, it has never happened to me, but I, there are people around me for many, many years that I, that could have happened. Um, yeah. So I'm very sorry you had to deal with that. Yeah. And, but what really strikes home, Gemma, is that you saw the roots of how you could be helpful in your continuous improvement practice. Mm -hmm. You saw that listening, right? And you are solidly based in respect for people, obviously that, as you said, that was all about your relationships, but this drove you, I think, uh, toward yeah. the more of the listening and, and as you said, getting that clarity. So now you've, you've built a guide for continuous improvement practitioners to use their skills in suicide prevention, which is a really bold and generous project. Obviously, this is a project of the heart. But, but given your numbers, this is an incredibly critical project. You know, you're talking about double the rate of, of homicide, which candidly, I did not know. So what I want to know is what did you use? Uh, can you give us some background on how you approached building this guide? So I wanted to build the guide um, so that, you know, CI people can, can use it as, um, as, as inspiration, as, as a way to think about how they can tweak the skills and tools and techniques they've already got, you know, but how to focus those on people. So I, I just, I kind of threw loads of stuff at the wall, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, and I've, and I've, I've organized it. So hopefully it makes sense. You know, the sections about, you know, how to listen, you know, how to listen well, which a lot of us in CI will know already, but, um, you know, just some focus and some tips around that, you know, good questions to ask. Um, and again, you know, most CI people probably done a lot of that already in terms of, you know, not giving the answer, but asking the questions instead. But there's some, I've tried to give some advice around that. Um, there's also some pieces around, you know, making stuff visual, because one of the things I do think is that we, we could encourage people to talk more about their feelings, um, about, you know, if we can get people to talk about their feelings with relation to non-personal emotional things, like, hey, we're doing a process map on, you know, we're, we're drawing up this process map. Let's talk about how you feel at each stage. Like, oh, I feel angry there. Why? Oh, because I have to walk, you know, the, the length of the of the warehouse to go get that tool when I shouldn't have to. It should be here. All right. OK. What about here? Oh, I feel frustrated there. So if we can get people to talk about emotions and feelings in those areas, then maybe they'll be more inclined to talk about emotions and feelings when it really matters. So I like to, to do that. You know, my method of, of talking about feelings and process mapping is about making things visual and teaching people how to draw faces with emotions on, for example. So, you know, just drawing a face with a swirly line above the top and, you know, a kind of a frown, that's frustration. And if you can get people to start thinking in that way, um, I think that can be really helpful. So that's an example of one of the tools that I've got in the resource is kind of a guide in how to help people maybe make their feelings more visual when you're doing that kind of mapping work. That's great. That's really great. Um, and that reminds me, or that sort of sparks what you've got and that you designed this before you got into this project is the change curve. Yeah. Uh, which you've beautifully illustrated. And I think you're touching on it now, but I look at it and I think, oh, well, that's applicable to this topic, but I know you built that before you em embarked on this project. Yeah, the, the change curve or my version of the change curve, because it's kind of a combination of, of other, other things that are out there. And I've, I've been using that, um, I've been using that for years, you know, 10, 15 years. And it's, a, it's something that I show to people whenever we start any kind of change activity. And it's sort of showing how people move through different phases and different emotions and that's completely normal um, and it's kind of a an indicator that hey change is going to happen because that's what we do that's what we're here to do and different people will cope with that differently and some people's 
change curve is very deep you know they get really affected by it some some is very shallow some people are up and down all the time but the point is you know I'm trying to prompt people to look around notice the the signs from other people notice the signals and think about how those people are feeling uh, whether you're their leader or their colleague or they work you know you work for them uh, we can still we're all humans at the end of the day and we can use that to sort of as an indicator and I use it with companies as a visual you know whereabouts are you on that curve right now because sometimes it's easier for people to talk about that than to say you know actually I'm feeling pretty rubbish right now you know you can actually use it as a visual they can use a finger to point this is where I am um so yeah that's a tool that I've been using for a long time and it's really useful for when you're approaching change but also I think it's useful for even if you're not in actual change you know there's still because people can have stuff going on outside of work they can have personal things going on that's causing them anxiety and and stress not just actual workplace change and stress yes I think I saw the change curve as well and I think the fact that you are really you know I think this is <clears throat> uh, another way for us to apply the thinking you know for, for many years we have people ask well how does this apply here and how do I apply this tool or how do I apply this thinking here and how does that relate to accounting or how does that relate and it's just another example of how this can really help in so many situations. And this problem, suicide, is another yet another application to some of the things that we use every day. But now we can actually help somebody make a good decision or get through a really difficult time. Definitely. And, you know, I saw this change curve as well. And, you know, I have you know, uh, I was going through a significant change last year and I'm like, yep, I did that. <laughs> right? And, you know, I sometimes go back on the explore curve, <laughs> go back into the, <laughs> into the, this, the, the valley there. But, uh, but it does help. It does help to recognize that it's a pattern and it is normal. And, you know, somehow that makes it, like, oh, this is this is something that everybody experiences and, and, you know, how do we get through it? So what are the steps that people can take to become more aware of or help others who are experiencing stress? What are some other things? So there's a there's a link on the on the resource board that obviously I'm going to share the links with you to share with everyone. But there's a link on there to some training, a 20 minute training module you can do with the Zero Suicide Alliance. They're based in the UK, but the training is open to anyone across the world. It's a 20 minute training module that helps you be able to respond better if somebody tells you, or if you suspect that someone is suicidal. So number one, you can start there. It's 20 minutes, have a cup of coffee, go through that training module. It's some really great examples of situations you could find yourself in, and it gives different, you know, different scenarios. Um, it's really cleverly done. And I think it's a really good starting point. Um, another thing people can do is mental health first aid training. Like I did a two day course um, and it was it was really eye opening. And obviously that's not just about suicide. That's about all mental health. And I would say actually all of this is appropriate. This is not just about reducing suicide, although that obviously that's particularly important to me. But it's about people with any kind of mental health issue. And I read some stats today that said that in the UK, one in six adults meets the criteria for a common mental health disorder. That's one in six people are living with a mental health issue. In the US, it's one in five. So if you think, if, you've, if you work in a company of, of 100 people, say your company's got 100 people in, between 16 and 20 of those people have a mental health issue. And this is what I mean, you know, every company um, has for physical first aiders. And a lot of companies are now starting to have mental health first aiders. But in my experience, a lot of those mental health first aiders sit within the HR team or the health and safety team, which that's great. And I'm sure they do a wonderful job. But I also know of a lot of people who, if they had a problem, they wouldn't go running to HR. 
And this is, you know, I strongly believe that we've got this army of CI people out there who've, who've spent the time to build relationships, to build trust. You know, people, as a, as a CI manager, I often didn't have any direct reports, but I would be working with people across the whole organization. And they would come and talk to you. They would tell me their deep, dark secrets. You know, they would share with me the, the way they, things that were going on. And I think, so I think there's a, you know, there's a potential to, to unleash some more energy and some more support for people across that, so many organizations. That so resonates, Gemma, because I think you're right. Even as an external coach, uh, people are telling me what's getting in the way of them working on their project. And it could be, it's stress at home, it's stress on the job. It's, you, you really hear what's going on with people at a very elemental level. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I think you're right about this available army and, and well-situated. And I wanted to touch on, you've built a mural board, which we're letting our, our, our listeners see as you're talking about it. And I know it's a work in progress and I know it'll eventually be a phenomenal website, like anything, everything you do, Gemma. Um, but I wanted to touch on some of the resources that you've already got in there which I'm intrigued about. One of them, uh, you include questions from Michael Bunjay Stanier's book, The Coaching Habit. We've had him at the cafe. Um, we both love that book. And you highlight just a couple of the questions, which is great. And one I love is what's on your mind. And I don't necessarily use that. And I think I might use it more after this conversation because it's so apt. A perfect question given the topic. Another resource you mentioned is a book called How to Listen from Katie yeah. Columbus. And I feel like I should know this, but could you give us a window into that book? So this is a book, um, it's actually written in collaboration with the Samaritans, who are an organization in the UK who are focused on suicide prevention. Um, you know, their phone lines are open um, all times of day for people to call for help. Um, so it's really a book about how to listen um, and, you know, how to how to not jump in. Um, and it's easy to say, well, that book doesn't need to be very long. You know, just 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 ask a question and shut up, you know, don't answer. But it's got some really lovely examples um, and it's got some really lovely techniques and things to follow to help you be a better listener. Um, Sometimes people do what, you know, it's not just about being quiet. It's about your body language. It's about your facial expression. It's about where you ask the questions. Um, so yeah, it's a really wonderful resource. It's a wonderful book. I think you just gave me a title for a great book, which is just ask a question and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> really puts a fine point on it, Gemma. <laughs> um, that's really helpful. That makes me intrigued because I feel like you're, you're seeing the cross currents between uh, these different realms. Obviously you've, you've done deep dives into the Zero Suicide Alliance, into this book built specifically for mental health, but then you realize we're up close and personal with uh, the mental health of the people that we're working with all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. And not just people with mental health issues, right? It's people struggling, you know. Um, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but there's a trend of uh, high schoolers that are depressed, more and more depressed. Yeah. There's more more teenagers on Xanax than in the history of, of our existence. And yeah. what's happening there? And why? And I, I, like you, have two boys. One is 14 and one is 18. And, um, you know, I worry about those things too. I mean, am I supporting them in the right way? Am I asking the right questions? Am I doing the right thing? Do they feel alone? And um, yeah. so just, it's just good. Just, it's just, it's really helping us to remember to connect with people, right? And, um, that there's something happening where that's not happening as easily as it used to, even though we have every device possible <laughs> to do it. So yeah, I think uh, what you're doing is, is really amazing, Gemma. And we were happy to have you come to the cafe to share what you're working on uh, to help make people's lives better 
easier, uh, more lovely, like you. Oh, bless you. Bless you. I, I should say as well, you know, this is an ongoing project. You know, I, it's, it's something I've been thinking about and working on for the last, um, kind of the last year and a half, if I'm honest, um, in different guises. But I've got to the stage where I can't wait for this to be perfect anymore before I do something. So that's why it's, you know, it's a mural board. It's not a website yet. That's why it's, you know, I'm iterating, I'm experimenting. And, you know, I want to hear from people. So I want to, if, if it's useful, um, if there's something else I could add, you know, I'm I'm really interested to know. Um, I didn't want to, yeah, I didn't want to keep going without putting something out there. So this isn't the finished product and it's going to develop over time. But I really think there's a there's a chance here to make a difference. Um, and for those people that, you know, that think suicide is is unusual and, you know, isn't isn't going to touch them. You know, a, another stat that I just want to drop in is one in five people will at some point in their life have suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. One in five people. Yeah. So, you know, look around you, look at the people you're working with, whether they're, you know, Inside, whether you're inside a company or you're an external provider, you know, there's there's people there who who need help and who want someone to listen to. And, and I think CI people could provide some of that answer. Well, I'm excited for this. I know that uh, it, the what is it? The enemy of don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And in your case, useful. Right. You've already got something incredibly useful. And I love the image of tapping this army of continuous improvement practitioners to something that is right there in front of them. Uh, and this is uh, exciting, useful, critical. I so uh, appreciate what you've done, Gemma. And how do people uh, connect with you if they wanna get involved in this or just connect with you if they want to? So my website is sparkimprovement.co.uk. So you can, and you can reach me through that. It's got my email um, and my phone number, but also, uh, you know, link up with me on LinkedIn. I'm Gemma Jones on LinkedIn. So yeah, it, I'd love to hear from people if they've got ideas and if they've tried things and it'd be really wonderful to hear from people. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming to the cafe, Gemma. We were yeah, going to have you back welcome. as many times as we can. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Mwah. I really appreciate it. Be sure to register for our February 24th webinar with Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt, Amanda Zimmerman. She's going to talk about how to make projects much easier and continuous improvement much easier for people to apply. We can always use some insights around that. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. Amanda recently moved to New Zealand. It's going to be our first New Zealand presenter. <laughs> yes, I love it. So we are thrilled to have your company. The Just In Time Cafe is a great place because of our fabulous community. And I wish I could hug them all at the same time. True, Tracy. Me too. Join us next month for your jolt of lean caffeine.